we have to slow down because on the global road, there are different people with different work styles, with different attitude and different belief system. And we really have to make sure that uh, we do what we can in order to handle all those cultural bumpers <laughs> along the way. <laughs> And in understanding this mutual influence, how we as individuals, how can we become more aware of our actions and the actions of others? And if we want to do something good in the world, how can we harness the benefits of globalization and technology for the greater good? That's why being globally competent is so, so important. Hello, welcome to the Leaders of Learning podcast. I'm your host, Ling Ling. The Leaders of Learning podcast is a show that explores learning in the 21st century with educators, leaders, and entrepreneurs from around the world. Check out our website on www.leadersoflearning.asia. You can also follow us on our social media on Instagram, Pinterest, and YouTube. With globalization, it is inevitable that our society is increasingly diverse. Technology has enabled companies to operate virtually and in multiple countries. The improved mobility and accessibility has enabled the global workforce to fill talent gaps in far-flung places. Even so, the once homogenous neighborhood has welcomed Nepali security guards, Filipino nurses, Korean chefs, and many others. The heterogeneity of a society or organization can be a big advantage in our competitive world, only if it is harnessed well. Without a doubt, we need to learn how to adapt and navigate in our culturally diverse world. But where do we start? Do we need extensive travel experiences? Would it be different for a person from the West as opposed to a person from the East? Joining us is Metal Barouche an organizational consultant, intercultural trainer, professional speaker, and founder of Global Mindset. Welcome to the podcast, Maital. Hello, Ling Ling. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. How did you get into the intercultural business? What is it about this field that fascinates you? Okay, so the reason I decided to go into the intercultural field is actually because of my own painful experience and the number of, you know, cultural mistakes that I've made when I first came to Singapore. So I was born in Israel and in 2007, when I moved to Singapore, I started studying and working with local people and I noticed that my usual behavior is not perceived very well. <laughs> and that experience was quite shocking to me, especially, you know, at the age of 30, when I already have some confidence on how to socialize with people. So when I found myself struggling with all these negative vibes, it made me want to find out why it's happening and, and what exactly went wrong. Because in Israel, usually people like me. And I think what fascinates me most in this field is the influence that culture has on almost every aspect of our life. And the fact that we usually don't pay attention to it because it's such integrated part of who we are. So we only get a chance to notice that when we work with people from different culture. And we spoke about each other's stories before. What about you, Ling Ling? What is about the intercultural fields that fascinates you? Well, I am born in Malaysia, but I had lived and worked in six different countries in my entire life. And with every move, it has not been easy. So even though I know how to speak the local language in every place that I move to, I faced with miscommunication, I faced misunderstanding and conflicts with friends, with colleagues, with neighbors. Well, miscommunication and conflict has become a part of life. So while it can be challenging to move from country to another, but in retrospect, if I 
think back of my times when I move, I felt that I learned a lot, I adapt a lot, and in adapting to a new culture, it helps me to appreciate and respect different perspectives and different ways of life. Ultimately, it helped me to become more resilient, more flexible, more empathetic and humble. And of course, a more open-minded person, because I know that there's so many different ways of living in the world today. So when shifting in and out of cultures, it fascinates me because every culture has a different way of living, a different set of rules and a different rules in interacting. So I am in absolute awe in the diversity of cultures in the world. Imagine there's 7 billion people out there and everyone is living their own unique way of living. Imagine how many cultures are out there in the, wo- in the world. So this reminds me of how people can be resilient and be very, very adaptable. So I know we both have extensive global experiences, but what does it mean to you when we talk about going from local to global or becoming more global? Okay, that's a very good question. Um, the way I see it, to go from local to global basically means to be able to move beyond our cultural zone and the automated behavior and to become more self-conscious when we interact with other people. Basically, to be open to experiences and new way of doing things, very similar to the experience that you went through. And if you allow me to use the analogy of driving, uh, when we drive the local road, it's quite easy. I mean, we can drive faster, the road is smooth, we work with people from similar background, so the communication is much more easy and the way we think is quite similar. But when we drive the global road, we have to slow down because on the global road, there are different people with different work styles, with different attitude and different belief system. And we really have to make sure that uh, we do what we can in order to handle all those cultural bumpers (laughs) along the way. (laughs) So (laughs) we really have to slow down and try to minimize the impact. Even when when we crash into them, it's probably good because that's the way we learn. But if we can try to minimize that it will be very helpful. Now, there are so many reasons why we all need to learn how to go global. What do you believe, Ling Ling, are the key reasons to be more globally competent? I love your analogy about driving on the local road. And that is in relation to becoming more globally competent because we can't just go fast and conquer the world, we need to slow down and think and reflect on how we want to approach it. Because what happens in the world today will have an impact locally, and what you do locally will have an impact globally. So let me give you a couple of examples. I recently saw a documentary on fast fashion. And if you think about it, 10 years ago, the fast fashion brands were not as accessible as they are today. If you walk on any high street, you go into any shopping center, you find fast fashion brands everywhere. And because of this increased demand globally for fast fashion, therefore there is a greater demand on cotton and thus cotton fields. But to grow cotton requires a lot of water. So this resulted in a massive expansion of of cotton fields, especially in the Aral Sea in Uzbekistan. Now, because it requires a lot of water, The Aral Sea, formerly the world's fourth largest sea, has shrunk to 10% of its original size. So because of the global demand on fast fashion, it had a local impact of the people who are living around the Aral Sea. Another example I want to give to you is how one person somewhere in the world can have such a global impact. And you may have heard this person's name. Her name is uh, Greta Thunberg. So she's a 16-year-old Swedish girl who started demonstrating outside of the Swedish parliament last year in August, in fact, so August 2018. So every Friday, she would hold a strike in front of the Swedish parliament, calling for stronger climate change action. So this one-person demonstration soon became a nationwide campaign, Call Future for Friday. And within six months, since the start of her demonstration, more than 20,000 students held strikes in at least 270 cities around the world. So within a year, because of this one person's effort, she has started a global movement everywhere. 
So becoming more globally competent is ever more important because one person's action can have a global consequence and the global demand can have an impact on local communities. And in understanding this mutual influence, how we as individuals, how can we become more aware of our actions and the actions of others? And if we want to do something good in the world, how can we harness the benefits of globalization and technology for the greater good? That's why being globally competent is so, so important. It's not as easy as people think, though, the examples I've given. Even if we live in a multi multicultural society, learning to navigate in a globalized or internationalized environment can be challenging. But for you, Maital, someone who comes from a Western developed nation, what were your key challenges when you first uh, moved to Singapore? Okay, so I just want to say that the example that you gave are very inspiring and shows that uh, there are so many benefits to go global. So I think one of the biggest challenges in working in a global environment that I used to face is that many times we don't get each other right. <laughs> and <laughs> I can agree. <laughs> <laughs> Personally, I had many conversations at work when, when I struggled to understand what the other person is trying to tell me. Because the message was not that clear to me. And that is probably because I grew up in a very direct culture. You know, I learned to pay attention only to what people say, uh, not to what people don't say, and only to the exact word that they are using and, and not to the meaning behind those words. So basically, I had zero experience with knowing how to read between the lines. And when you don't have these skills, you might be missing lots of important information. And that could lead to misunderstandings and, and even damage business relationship. So when I moved to Singapore, I had to redefine the whole way I communicate with people. So you mentioned that you had to redefine the whole way of communicating with people when you came to Singapore. What did you have to change within yourself in terms of communicating here? What did you have to change in your form of communication? Okay, so in terms of changing the way I communicate, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I come from a very direct culture. And sometimes uh, when we want to deliver a message, there is uh, a very direct way to do it, uh, which basically may hurt or be offensive to other people. And that's what I had to learn. How do I actually apply the art? I call it art because I really think it's art to be able to communicate indirectly. So what word exactly I should use to make the other person realize that maybe I disagree or maybe I think differently, but without saying it directly. So this is something that I really had to practice and also to make sure that, you know, I don't have to repeat my ideas again and again and again. I mean, sometimes there is a tendency for people from the West to make sure that, you know, the, the other person got it. But Basically, I think because of the amazing listening skills of people from uh, Asian cultures, I learned that it's enough to say it one, no need to repeat 10 times. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you, my child, in many ways, because that is one of the greatest challenge as an Asian person to navigate a globalized world because of someone from an Asian origin. We're actually taught to listen first to understand the others. And in a way, we say that if you interrupt the other person, it's considered rude. So we always have to wait for the other person to finish their sentence, pause a little bit before we actually go in and, and start sharing our opinion. As an Asian person, when I go into, say, a Western developed environment, so my very first job was with this huge American company and their American culture actually seeps into every country. So you've got bits of American culture in, in every country where they have a base. Coming from an, an Asian background, when I first went into meetings with Americans, it felt overwhelming because, yes, I need to listen to them. But at the same time, they were interrupting each other, which I felt was completely rude. And not only that, at the end of the meeting, because I was listening, trying to understand. I didn't speak up. I didn't give my opinions whether I agree or disagree, but I wanted to take the time to to digest the information that was being thrown in the meeting. 
But instead, that was misperceived as I have nothing to contribute. Mm. I'm stupid or <laughs> I'm not interested. So that was one of my biggest challenge. And in working in that kind of environment, I had to learn how to speak up. I had to learn how to say to myself, it's okay to interrupt. It's okay to say, I believe your idea is crap. Because <laughs> it's, it's very uncomfortable for me to directly tell someone else and say that your idea will not work. It's not comfortable. I'm used to saying things in an indirect way just so that we can maintain our relationship. Everyone can maintain their face and we show mutual respect and diplomacy. Yes, and, and what I have noticed, Ling Ling, that many times when the indirect people trying to adopt the direct style, because it's so unnatural to them, they taking it to the exact extreme. So they become over direct, even in relation to the direct people. Uh, you sound like you have a fantastic story to share there. Mind if you could share with our listeners about that? Yes, yeah, so, so I remember... Uh, There was one client that he wanted to encourage his employees to speak up more and to challenge him and not to accept everything that he says and just follow him. So one of the guy took it uh, very, very seriously. And every opportunity, like every meeting, every conference, every time there was a session, he immediately showed his objection because <laughs> that's what he got. Uh, advice by the, the manager to interrupt. So at a certain point, this client felt uncomfortable because he felt that it's too much. You know, I, I didn't mean you have to interrupt me all the time and challenge me all the time. So this is what I mean, that it's, it's very hard because you need to really know how to do it properly. And that takes time. It's a skill that takes time. Yeah, you are right. So being intercultural or becoming more globally competent requires time to learn. So sometimes you go to the extreme, but with practice and exposure, I think we'll be able to adjust accordingly to, to different situations, right? Exactly. So it sounds like we both have encountered many cross-cultural conflicts, and I'm sure you have some memorable incidences. Mind if you could share one of your memorable incidences? Yes, yeah, sure. So basically, one of my memorable incidents was while I was taking my master's degree and we used to work in uh, groups. Uh, we had group assignments. And the thing about group assignments is that in Israel, when you work in groups, it's very normal, natural, and even advisable to disagree with each other, to challenge each other's idea, and in order to come up with the best input. So when I first, you know, did it with a Singaporean group, uh, I have to tell you, <laughs> it was not a success at all. Because in Singapore, the harmony of the group is, is something that is very important, is a strong value. And it is definitely not an environment that people are encouraged to, to debate each other. So... It perceived very, very uh, wrong. And I had to slowly learn how to be quiet more and not to confront people and try to express my ideas in a more gentle way. And this is something that uh, took me time. But at the beginning, the, the reaction that I got from people was actually it reached to a point uh, that when I entered the class, they didn't say hello to me. Oh, my goodness. Because they were so offended with, with my communication style. I can completely see your situation, Maital, because I'd been on both sides of uh, such communication, coming from both Western and Asian education background. In an Asian education or classroom, it is considered disrespectful to raise your hand and directly confront or challenge the lecturer because it means that the lecturer is wrong, they don't know anything, and the lecturer might lose their face. Whereas if in a Western classroom, it is considered um, good brownie points if you're able to challenge the lecturer because the lecturer wants 
their students to learn how to think for themselves, to ask really silly questions, and to create a discussion so that they will know you are learning. So what is being valued in one classroom and another classroom are very, very different. <laughs> yeah, I agree, I agree. I mean, I remember my, my first day, I was trying to impress my classmates. So I keep like raising my hands and I, you know, try to challenge the professors. So I, because I wanted to, people to think that I'm smart. Because, mm -hmm. you know, when you do it in Israel, it means you are smart. But it's, it's not well accepted yeah, in Singapore. Definitely. I, I had the opposite experience because I did my psychology master's in, in the UK and everyone was raising their hands, uh, was giving their opinion, but I wasn't doing much in the classroom. I was just sitting and listening to everyone. And then sooner or later, I realized that I didn't get grades, good grades, because I didn't stand up in the class to express my opinions and my perspective because you do get points for participating in classroom discussions, for giving a different perspective that is not memorizing what the lecturer says and regurgitating it. For me, that was a bit uncomfortable because I'm not used to raising up in my hands in front of a group of people to share my perspective at that point in time. So it's the complete opposite of yours. If I didn't raise my hand and challenge the lecturer, I don't get points for my grades. Yeah, that's very interesting. But, but you should get extra points for listening skill, Ling Ling, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> because I'm sure that, you know, the, the ability to listen so well enable you to reach to a deep learning. Because, you know, everybody say when you talk, you don't really learn. When you listen, you can learn more, right? That happens internally, but if you listen and there's no output, there's nothing to show that you've been listening. So we've come from opposite sides of the education system. <laughs> Maital, where do you think people should start if they want to learn how to navigate this culturally complex world? Uh, where people should start. Mm. You know, in Singapore, when you take the MRT, before the train doors are open, there is uh, an announcement that says, uh, please mind the platform gap. Yeah, you notice I, know, that? <laughs> I, I noticed that too. Yes, so I think that's where people should start by minding the cultural gap. And, you know, by being aware of the different working styles that exist between culture. And once you are able to notice the gap, then you can adjust better. Now, in terms of cultural adjustment, many times people wonder, I mean, who should adjust to whom? The person is moving to a new culture or the people who are the host country? And I usually say, this is not about one side adjusting to the other side, but it's more about both sides are trying to get closer to each other. And that's how the gap is getting smaller. So basically, we all need to adjust. I totally agree with you, Maital. It's not just about one person having to change their entire self to adapt to another culture. It's both parties putting in the effort to meet somewhere in the middle to close the gap. I like how you put it, Maital. Thank you, Ling Ling. What else do people need to consider to navigate cultural complexities more effectively? On top of what you've already provided, which I think is fantastic, I believe intercultural skills or being more globally competent is just like any other skill. We need to gain the right experiences and we need to practice. So for me, there are three things that we need to do. One is to get exposure, to get the experiences. And this can be any kind of cultural experiences. It could be watching TV shows that you're not used to watching, listening to music that is different from your own culture, making friends and connection online or in person that is someone very, very different from you. So one, be curious, get exposure and get the experience. The second thing I think people need to think about is to reflect on those experiences. So reflect in terms of, uh, what does this mean for the other person? So when it comes to, say, communication, if you speak about something, it could mean something to you, but it could mean something to someone else. So think about what does the meaning of something for someone else. And of course, in your interaction, in your exposure, it's good to think about how does this impact me as a person? So the example we gave about how we communicate in the classroom, so 
how does this impact me in my classroom when I was taking my psychology is that if I don't speak up, even though it's uncomfortable, I'm seen as someone who has nothing to contribute, who's someone who's not interested, so therefore I get low grade. But what impact it has on you when you speak up is that people choose to not befriend you because they feel offended. And the way we behave has different meaning for the other when we behave that way. And finally, the most important thing is to learn from the experience. So we both learn that being too direct or being too indirect has uh, negative consequences for us in terms of our experiences in the different culture. So we have to learn from it. And when we learn from it, we adjust. So for me, I have to speak up a lot more. For one meeting, maybe I speak up one time. Another meeting, I speak up two or three more times. And then hopefully over time, it'll become better and better. Maybe for you, my tal is to be less direct in the classroom or to use different methods of providing your opinion, your message. Instead of raising your hand in class, maybe you use try different strategies to still get your message across without having yes. to offend people, I think. And I really like your, your advice, Ling Ling, you know, to take it gradually, step by step, because it's definitely not something that can happen to you overnight. I mean, it takes years. I've been living here for 12 years and I'm still consider myself as a learner. Although, you know, I already in the intercultural field, as well as you. So we, we took the learning even step further and we decided that, okay, let's take all what we learn and now it's time to, you know, share this wisdom and knowledge with other people. But we learn every day. Every day we learn something new. It's like an unlimited journey. It is. It's a never-ending journey. And you are right. Because of our experiences, we want to be able to help other people to navigate this cultural complexity because it's not easy. And many people take for granted that it's an easy thing to do. And actually, it's not. And life is a learning journey. We will make many mistakes and hopefully we can look back, laugh about them and learn from them because that's what we're here to do, to keep learning and keep growing. If we think about people moving from cultures, like for you, Maital, what is the one thing that someone should do if they want to prepare to work in a different location or to relocate overseas? I guess one thing people should do is to ask themselves, you know, how motivated am I to make a change within myself? Because many times people are changing environments, but refusing to change themselves. And One of the reasons people struggle to adjust is because they are using their old mindsets in their new environment. So if you want to succeed globally, you have to adopt a new mindset, a global mindset. Yes, definitely. Global mindset. <laughs> And what is your one strategy, Ling Ling? I think what most people do when they want to prepare to work overseas is that they do research first and they interview people who, or at least speak to people who have been there before. So for me, the one important strategy is to connect with someone, either a coach or a community that is based in the new location that understands where you come from and understands the culture that you're going to. It's actually much easier today to be able to find someone like that with social media, with all the different expat groups that are out there. And when you have someone whom I call a cultural coach, they will be of tremendous help in helping you to interpret different situations. So you might think a situation might mean this, but for the other person, it might mean something else. And this person, this cultural coach, will be able to help you see both worlds. Because if you're not exposed to the new culture before, you won't be able to see their perspective. So it's important to have a social support system. I mean, don't lose touch of the family and friends that you've left behind in your old location, but remember to create new connections in your new location as well. A support system can help you a long way to thrive. Yes, I fully agree with you, Ling Ling. I'd like to thank you so much, Maital, for being on the show and for discussing our favorite topic. Woohoo! <laughs> Thank you for having me, Ling Ling. It was lovely talking to you about our favorite topic. <laughs> yeah. So for our listeners, it's something that me and Maital, we talk about all the time because we are in this intercultural space and we thoroughly enjoy helping people to, to navigate this complex, global and intercultural world we are in. So if our listeners want to reach out to you, Maital, how can they do so? 
Oh, thank you very much, Ling Ling. Uh, basically, you can look for my profile on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, just look for my name. Okay, that is uh, Maital Barush. Is that how you pronounce it? In the Singaporean version, yes. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean by Singapore okay, version? So basically, my name is Maital Barush, but it's I find it very hard for Asian to pronounce the. <laughs> okay, let me you, try. You want to try? Maital Barush. <laughs> Almost, almost. You almost there, Ling Ling. Ba- Baruch, Baruch. Yes, yes, you Baruch. got it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well done, Ling Ling. You're just being too kind, my talk. <laughs> so you can reach out to her on LinkedIn, or you can reach out to me at www.culturesparkglobal.com, and we will be happy to to support you in navigating intercultural complexities through our program, consultation, or coaching. So reach out to us at any time. Thank you, Maita. Thank you, Ling Ling. That was Maita Barush and I speaking about going global. If you're interested in intercultural programs or consultation for your leaders, your teams, your organization, Feel free to reach out to me at www.culturesparkglobal.com. That is www.culturesparkglobal.com. For the next episode, we will wrap up the season with a summary and review of the wisdom and learnings from our season three guests. Stay tuned! If you enjoy listening to this podcast, take a moment to rate and review us on Apple Podcast, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcast, or wherever you download your podcast. Follow us on Instagram, Pinterest, and YouTube. If you believe this podcast show will help a friend or family, please share this episode with them via social media or your podcast app. I'm your host, Ling Ling. Thank you for listening to the Leaders of Learning podcast. podcast.